During the summer of 1866, under the leadership of then-Mayor William George, South Bend was engaged in some of the most rapid and occasionally haphazard city building that the Midwest has ever seen. The work would pay off, but not without a few hiccups along the way. And those hiccups left lots of room for the critics to have their say. The papers seized on the holes and craters that had been dug amidst the construction and deconstruction, then left abandoned and left to fill with still and dirty water. The St. Joseph Valley Register repeated or originated a whisper about a malaria and cholera outbreak that was almost certain and was maybe already happening. The actual history doesn't show much evidence of that, and probably the headline was a ruse to sell newspapers. But for the people of South Bend, it didn't matter. The fear of disease was real, even if the presence of it was not. Fortunately for them, there was also a person to allay their fears. George appointed Dr. Lewis Humphreys as the city's first health officer, and in the name of public health, he set to filling holes. South Bend had been saved. South Bend had a new hero. And a few years later, they would elect that hero to become head of their government during what might have been the most exciting time in South Bend's history. By now, it was 1868, and Dr. Lewis Humphreys had just become the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Hello and welcome to Abend in Time, presented by the History Museum in South Bend. I'm your host, Aaron Hellman, and during this eight-episode series, we're going to dive into the dawn of the city of South Bend, the first 25 years after its incorporation, through the lens of its first eight mayors. During the course of this episode, you'll hear fictional advertisements for very real historical companies and products. We do that to help break up the podcast, provide some levity, to include just a little more history than we could otherwise, and to give you a sense of the time and place when and where all of this is happening. The absence of actual paid advertisements is made possible by the generous underwriting of all eight episodes in this series by Andy and Tina Nickel of South Bend. And now, with all that out of the way, let's jump into the life and times and administration of Dr. Lewis Humphreys, the second mayor of South Bend. Humphreys came from an Irish family in Ohio and landed in South Bend in 1844 to set up practice as a general physician and surgeon. He was running advertisements for his services in the St. Joseph Valley Register as early as 1845, inviting patients to visit his office at the corner of Main and Washington Streets downtown. His claimed specialty was in treating all optical ailments. He'd pack up his doctor's kit during the Civil War, serving as a field surgeon, and doing so admirably enough to earn even the admiration of a certain President Abraham Lincoln. By the war's end, Lincoln appointed Humphreys to serve as one of ten Army medical inspectors. When South Bend was incorporated in 1865, Humphreys was probably best equipped to serve as the city's first mayor. He was a dyed in the wool Republican his town's most beloved physician, and he held a personal vote of confidence from his country's martyred president. There was just one problem. Humphreys wasn't back from the battlefields just yet. The war may have been over, but there was still plenty of work to be done for army medics, physicians, and their wounded. William George would be the city's first mayor, but in the aftermath of the stymied malaria scare, it seemed that he was just keeping the seat warm for his friend until the election of 1868. But first, there was the matter of actually winning the election, a task that wouldn't prove terribly difficult. South Bend's Democratic Party was in shambles by 1868. The winner of its primary, Dr. J. M. Stover, refused to accept the mayoral nomination. The runner-up, Joseph Henderson, also refused the nomination, and since there was no third-place finisher, he insisted Stover run. Stover refused once more, passing the torch again to the disinterested runner-up. By the time the round of political hot potato was ended, 
a reluctant Henderson was named his party's candidate. Similar battles, you can call them battles, were held for the offices of city treasurer, city clerk, city marshal, and city assessor. A St. Joseph Valley Register about the Democratic Convention proceedings used the word declined 11 times and italicized the word for effect each time. It wouldn't matter. None of them won office. Humphreys was running as a Republican in an overwhelmingly Republican place during an overwhelmingly Republican time and against a Democrat who absolutely did not want the job. Humphreys took the election by 20 points, was sworn into office in May 1868, and began to preside over what would become South Bend's era of good feelings. Humphreys inherited a well-set table from his predecessor. The town was growing, Continental Railroads were building branches through the city, and investment in new manufacturing ventures was through the roof. During his first year in office, James Oliver, inventor of the new chilled plow, fully incorporated as the South Bend Iron Works, Singer opened its operations, and the South Bend Gas Works, a precursor to today's Nipsco, opened up shop in the city as well. At the same time, Studebaker's business was exploding, and Clem Studebaker established himself as the kind of town patriarch who might have been more important than the city's mayor. There was a lot of good happening in South Bend, almost all of it outside of the bounds of the government, and all Lewis Humphreys had to do was stay out of the way of it. But that's not all. A week after Humphreys won the mayor's seat, South Bend's most famous resident was chosen as the candidate for the Republican vice presidential ticket. It was national news, and it was international news, but nowhere was the news bigger than in South Bend. Schuyler Colfax had been chosen at the Republican convention in Chicago, and when convention goers loaded their trains to head back east, many of them made a pit stop in South Bend to see the home of Colfax. The St. Joseph Valley Register ran a special edition of its paper to help show off the town to passersby. If Mayor Humphreys had been a man with an ego, he might have taken affront at the way his own hometown newspaper nudged him further and further back into the shrinking columns with the tiny type. But by all accounts, he reveled in the lack of attention. Schuyler Colfax could have the front pages, and the second pages too, for that matter. Humphreys didn't want or need the scrutiny. He just wanted to do his job. Or more accurately, he just wanted to do his jobs. That's because Humphreys continued to practice as a physician for the duration of his public career. The mayor job didn't pay very well, and maybe it didn't pay anything at all. And besides, the city needed a physician at least as much as it needed a mayor. Maybe more. For his first year as mayor, neither Humphreys nor the council did much in the way of legislation. They authorized paving of roads, approved streetlight contracts, rubber-stamped primitive building permits. Mayor Humphreys pushed the city to purchase land for a public park, but the effort never got off the ground. No one seemed to mind much. In the summer of 1868, it wasn't the mayor of South Bend's job to tend to the city. It was to serve as head cheerleader in the campaign to put General Ulysses S. Grant and Schuyler Colfax into the White House. Luckily, Humphreys had his pom-poms ready to go. He spoke and lectured at Colfax clubs, attended and led Republican rallies, received and chaired correspondence directly from Colfax himself. On July 30th, 1868, when Colfax spoke at the local fairgrounds, his only official campaign stop in South Bend, it was Lewis Humphreys who was tasked as the opening act for Colfax, speaking ahead of the man's entrance to the stage, then walking off while the adoring crowd launched into an ovation for someone else. South Bend took care of itself that summer, and when it couldn't, Clem Studebaker was happy to step in and make up the slack. Clem donated a fire bell to the city when the old one broke. He became part of the special police force who would be activated to barricade and protect the crowds and gawkers who had nothing better to do than watch an old building burn down. Clem even became part of a volunteer patrol designed to dissuade and catch would-be horse thieves, a reminder that 1868 was a different time. The year ended on an impossibly high note for the city of South Bend. Grant and Colfax had won the election. 
Mayor Humphreys presided over an extravagant banquet to mark the opening of the South Bend Gas Company, and then the future really arrived. On December 11, 1868, South Bend was lit by gas for the first time. The city was becoming a modern place with modern amenities and modern interests. We'll get into all of those right after the break. Advertising in the St. Joseph Valley Register is the best way to make sure the people of South Bend know all about your interest. And right now, you can buy space starting at just 50 cents. The Register is published every Thursday by Archibald Beal, Alfred Bryant Miller, and Elmer Crockett, and provides the most comprehensive coverage of any Republican newspaper in this half of the state. Inquire at the Register building at 86 Michigan Street. And now... Back to A Bend in Time, presented by the History Museum. As the calendar turned over into 1878, it revealed that the citizens of South Bend were content. Their guy was in the White House. Their town was prosperous. The people followed an early form of baseball, and box scores began to appear in newspapers for the first time. Whispers of a game that's not recognizable against the sport we see today. It wasn't uncommon for teams to score more than 50 runs apiece, and for those games to somehow last less than two hours. Southbenders also became obsessed with croquet, and then with early bicycles called velocipedes. Things were generally very good, and during the moments when they weren't good, the people of South Bend had plenty of diversions and generally the funds to enjoy them. The newspaper offered regular reporting on the comings and goings of Schuyler Colfax in a column they titled, Movements of the VP. By summer, Singer announced plans to double the size of its factory and workforce. Studebaker shipped a wagon directly to Sacramento via the Pacific Railroad, and Clem went with the thing, sending back news and dispatches from the road. The rapid growth of South Bend brought new people into the city some from across the country and some from across the world. The city's African-American population was growing, and by 1870 they'd established the Olivet African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first of its kind in the city. The first waves of the Polish and Hungarian immigrants who would later define the West Side had also just begun to trickle in, finding work in the city's growing industries. For Humphreys, besides the real work of being an 1860s doctor, he had the luxury to sit back and watch it all happen. For a few months, the register even stopped reporting the council proceedings, noting that there were petitions for a few roads to be paved, that everyone agreed to those petitions, then adjourned, and that this wasn't really news worth reporting anymore. The general harmony of the mayor and the council was good for South Bend, but it wasn't helping to sell papers. Even when there was controversy, the city government handled it in non-controversial ways. When a policeman named George Eskridge was served divorce papers by his wife, alleging and proving his cruelty and physical abuse toward him and their children, the council swiftly and quietly stripped him of his police powers. Things were running so smoothly in South Bend that besides keeping up with his day job as a local physician, Humphreys continued to serve on the board of Indiana State Hospital for the Insane making the trip down to Indianapolis once or twice a year to keep an eye on the happenings down there. By the spring of 1870, it was time for another election, one in which Humphreys was the assumed winner before the campaigning even began. He'd spent his first term as mayor content to leave well enough alone, and so too did the voters when it came time for re-election, keeping him in office by the same 20-point majority that had brought him there in the first place. During Humphrey's first term, he'd pushed a failed attempt to secure a city park for South Bend. This time, he came pushing a library. This effort fizzled, too. In part, it was because there was a lot going on already. And in part, there was some fear among fiscal conservatives that South Bend's young government had grown too much, too fast. Five years ago, they'd only had a marshal and a sexton on the payroll. By 1870, there were a half dozen city employees and a push to add two more. Shortly after he was sworn in for his second term, 
Humphreys led the push to add a city judge and city attorney to the staff. Then the real expensive stuff started to happen, and we'll get into all of that right after this message. The South Bend Iron Works would call attention of the farmers of northern Indiana to their chilled and cast iron plows, the best, the cheapest, and the most durable plows ever made. Our number 23 and number 24 right and left plows give the best satisfaction. Our single and double shovel plows are just what every farmer needs. Everyone who has used our Oliver Chilled Plow endorses its advantages. Farmers are invited to examine its merits and thereby judge for themselves. Take a test drive today at the South Bend Ironworks. And now, back to a bend in time brought to you by the History Museum. During its first years as an incorporated community, South Bend had chased as many low-dollar upgrades as possible in order to provide proper amenities for its growing population. Newer sidewalks, graded roads, brighter streetlights, adequate drainage, fire departments. By July 1870, they were needing to drop some more serious cash and began accepting bids for the erection of a more permanent steel truss bridge to deliver citizens and their ever heavier wagons from one side of the St. Joseph River to another. There wasn't much debate about the need for the bridge, and it's not like there were a lot of other ideas floating around about how the city might get one without, you know, paying for it. But for the most fiscally conservative voices in the city, South Bend was getting too expensive too suddenly. For the remainder of his term, Republican Lewis Humphreys would face more criticism from the thriftier bloc of his own party than he would from rival Democrats. But while those critical voices were present in the letters to the editor, they weren't sitting on the city council, a group that continued to operate in friendship and cooperation, even passing an ordinance in 1870 that criminalized the act of playing ball in the street within city limits. It would appear that South Bend's obsession with baseball had become dangerous for local windows. Humphrey spent the next year of his term as a spokesperson for the city and a proxy for the nation's vice president, speaking at political rallies, historical society meetings, veterans gatherings, and more. He rubber-stamped some zoning requests and helped pass a set of laws governing the city's auctioneers, but mostly he just stayed out of the way of the good thing that was happening in his city stepping in only occasionally to stop everything from burning down. Sometimes that meant literally. The fall of 1871 brought a massive drought to the Midwestern part of the United States. And when the Great Chicago Fire decimated that city, it was announced to the people of South Bend by the blowing clouds of smoke even before the headlines made the paper. Humphreys rounded up an emergency fire patrol to go looking for the flames instead of just responding to the ringing of Clem Studebaker's donated bell. The group caught six fires preemptively in the week before the rains came, and while there's no way to know what would have happened otherwise, the fire patrol might be the most important move the mayor ever made. That's because it wasn't just Chicago that burned to the ground in October 1871. It was a summer of flames across the Midwest, devastating towns in Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and Indiana. Some of those towns never recovered, at least not the way Chicago did. This moment of Humphrey's tenure, just a few months before his time in the office came to an end, best illustrates what Humphreys brought to the city. He was not a master legislator, and in fact he never saw progress on his initiatives to bring a park and a library to the city. A critical look at his record shows that the Iron Trust Bridge was the only real big initiative that ever got through. But Humphreys was fortunate to preside over that era of good feelings. He did not need to be a politician's politician to leave well enough alone. What the city needed then was a man they could root for, who could sell their city well, and who could rally the people to a cause when he needed to. That fire patrol was not something that was legislated. It was not something discussed or voted on by the council. The men who ran the patrol were not paid to do so. Instead, 
They were just citizens who'd answered the call of their leader to step up and contribute to the city. In that context, it's fitting that among Humphrey's final acts, and in a capacity as a civilian, maybe even more than a mayor, he requested and received a $5,000 investment for South Bend's newest high school building, drawn from none other than the investment interests of Schuyler Colfax, old friend and vice president of the United States. During Humphrey's final address before the council, he took care to defend his record and mostly pointed toward those who'd accused him of spending too much money. He took pains to point out that the city's population had doubled in four years, but that its budget had not. He pointed out the hundreds of thousands of dollars of property damage that had been forestalled by investments in the fire department and the South Bend Water Works. He mentioned that the city's bankable assets had increased more than four times over. And then he stepped out from the lectern, out of the mayor's office, and out of a limelight that had never been his to begin with. Humphrey's tenure had overlapped almost exactly with Colfax's time in the White House and lasted through some of the most explosive manufacturing and business growth in South Bend's history. That meant Humphrey's was never the main story in the papers, and he did his best to keep it that way. Seems like it worked out pretty well for him. Of course, South Bend's era of good feelings wasn't going to last forever, although maybe it was going to end sooner than anyone else thought. Either way, Lewis Humphreys wasn't going to be in the mayor's office when it happened. During his post-mayoral life, Humphreys was able to make good on one of his lost initiatives. He gathered a group of like-minded and influential South Benders and finally got that library off the ground. The same library organization we have today, just in a different building. His daughter was the first librarian in the city's history. Lewis Humphreys died in 1880 at the age of 63. He is buried in the South Bend City Cemetery. Hey, thanks for joining us on A Bend in Time, presented by the History Museum in South Bend. There's more history waiting for you at historymuseumsb.org. I'm your host, Aaron Hellman. The theme music is Whose Distance Is It Anyway by Neil Carmichael. Thanks again to Andy and Tina Nickel for underwriting this episode and all eight episodes in the Dawn of the City series. Our next episode in this series will pick up where this one left off with South Bend's third mayor, William Miller. And I hope you'll tune in for that one next. Until then, keep learning new things. And remember, everything is fascinating as long as you Stay curious.